When someone wants to buy their first rifle, they don't always have all of the really technical, deep knowledge to help them in purchasing their first weapon. So typically they go online, they've got to go to forums, AR15.com maybe, or they go look at reviews on Amazon, or maybe they take a stroll down to their local Gander Mountain or their favorite pawn shop, and they ask the person behind the desk for his opinion or her opinion on the best rifle out there, the best red dot out there. Now anyone asks, you didn't get this here. Do I need a weapon lot on my rifle? And whatever information they're given, well, that's what their perspective going into making their first purchase. Throughout this process, there are a number of very common mistakes that we see with first time rifle owners. I made a lot of these first mistakes when I started with my first rifle and even my second rifle. So what I'd like to do is go over five of these most common, or at least the ones that I've seen, some of the most common mistakes that we see, why they happen, and also how to fix them. So that if you are making your first purchasing decision on a rifle, you could skip uh, some uh, unnecessary spending, some unnecessary learning points that maybe you, you don't need to, to go through and uh, experience. And you can go straight to having something that's a little bit more effective, uh, a little bit smarter, and something that's actually going to last and serve you better. Most entry-level Air 15s on the market and other rifles as well are not coming with iron sights out of the box. Now, I'm kind of torn on that one because I think every rifle out of the box, it'd be really convenient if you could actually start going to work with it. But one reason they do this is so that you could save a little bit of money on the overall build and you can go and buy whatever sights you might want. You know, maybe those are metal uh, front, fixed front sight, you know, post and a rear sight. Maybe that's a polymer backup, you know, thing. Or maybe you just want to jump straight to an ACOG, something super durable, and that's going to be your primary sighting system. But a lot of folks out there, they kind of already know, thanks to Hollywood video games and stuff, that they, they want to go straight to a red dot. They want to go, they want to get away from the iron sight because the future is now, old man. Future's now, old man. They want to get some sort of red dot that they can use both eyes open. Now, they don't necessarily know always what red dot to get. So they Google cheapest red dot out there. They go buy an NC star. They go buy what they use in Call of Duty, that little Barska whatever thing uh, that is not really a usable red dot. Wow, that's a good one. And they go and they drop that onto their rifle. And oftentimes we see a lot of first gun owners making the mistake of purchasing a piece of crap optic that is not gonna hold up in recoil on that 5.56 rifle. Uh, it is not going to be very easy to zero. It's not gonna be something you're gonna be able to take out to distance. The warranty on it's probably not very good. And so they spend a hundred bucks, you know, or less than a hundred dollars uh, on their optic on their rifle. And then they're gonna have to upgrade at some point anyway, because that optic's not gonna last. So it might be a better idea to save up your money and buy something a little bit better out of the gate so you're not having to constantly swap and waste that money that you bought initially. And honestly, something that in this purchasing decision, I think is a great one, start with iron sights. You can get a good set of iron sights for like a hundred bucks. Metal fixed Daniel Defense iron sights on stick, stick that on your rifle. You can shoot those out to hundreds of meters and they're gonna hold up, they're gonna be durable, they're gonna hold their value and you can start training with iron sights, which I think is great for people to start doing. But if you wanna go straight to a red dot, cause you're like, ah, iron sights, I wanna unlock an attachment. I wanna, you know, both eyes open and all that good stuff. There's a lot of great options out there for 200 plus dollars uh, that do get the job done, but be very, very, very careful buying the cheapest thing you can find because there's usually a reason that it's the cheapest thing out there. It's only 50 bucks, I can't beat that. Dad. Because at the end of the day, what you are using an optic for, it is the sighting system on your rifle that enables you to get hits. Like it is one of the most important things, you know, whether it's a magnified or unmagnified or iron sight, it is one of the most important things that you're gonna put on your rifle because it is literally the thing that's gonna let you hit stuff. And I see people not grasping that concept. They just wanna slap something on there. And I guess they just want the feel of shooting a gun or, or knowing that their piggy bank is you know, preserved because they didn't spend a lot of money. But like the thing that you put on your gun right here is gonna be the thing that lets you hit stuff. So do not skimp on your optics. Do not skimp on your iron sights. Get something decent. You don't have to go out there and spend $1,000 on a red dot or something crazy as your first red dot out there. There's some really good ones out there. Uh, Aimpoint's got it, a nice entry level option. Um, there's obviously some companies in another uh, country that make some really good options out there as well. But be really careful just going and buying one on Amazon uh, for 30 bucks that you use in Call of Duty because that is not going to be a very usable optic on an actual decent rifle.
As far as options that I recommend, the Aimpoint Pro, like I mentioned it earlier, is one of the best out there. It comes in around $400. You can find old Army Issue M68 Aimpoints for under $400, and those are quality, quality optics that will maintain zero, they will hold zero, they've got good battery life, they've got excellent durability, and they also hold their value really well when you wanna sell that and upgrade to something else. Hollow Sun makes some good optics out there as well. I started with a primary arms uh, on my first rifle. It was like, I think it was 180 bucks or something like that. It worked pretty well, it wasn't too bad. But about a year after, or six months after I ran that one, I went and upgraded to a different optic, a more, you know, uh, entry level or nice optic. Um, EOTex are actually really good for the price considering they come with the mount. You don't have to buy anything else. You just take that sucker and you drop it right onto the gun. That's obviously going to be around $500. Uh, but there's a lot of really good options out there that you're not going to spend thousands of dollars for to get started. Uh, there's some good primary arms has some really good red dots out there. But again, have a plan to upgrade. Have a plan to make your kit better. Don't just buy one thing and go, ah, I'm good to go. I'll never need to buy something else. Have a plan to actually get something that's really going to serve you well long term and not just allow you to go to the range and kind of have both eyes open, shoot some stuff and, you know, thinking that's good enough. So EOTech's got some good stuff. Aimpoint's got some good stuff. Hollow Sun's got some good stuff. Primary Arms as well. Um, those are pretty much the companies that we recommend. We don't really recommend a bunch of the other ones out there. Uh, but again, you can go find your favorite YouTuber who's paid by those companies to do a review and probably get some confirmation bias from them. So that works pretty well, actually. So this is my group at 50 meters um, before dropping the optic. So again, I'm kind of like high and right. Very large group, very inaccurate. Um, with, with impeccable fundamentals, I might add. And then uh, over here, after dropping the optic from waist height, uh, the group actually tightened up for some reason. I, I might have been a little more careful with the shots too, but about in the same place. So it appears the sight mark will hold zero under all sorts of abuse. Another big one is people not understanding zeroing very well or not taking it very seriously and also just not understanding the importance of it or not understanding the reconvergence of the trajectory of the round from your gun. The fact that you can't really zero rifles at 10 meters and expect that that's, you're going to have good holds at you know every distance out to 50 or whatever and it gets real wonky when you try to do that. And most people when they start off they just kind of get it close enough because they want to they want to get to shooting. They don't want to sit down there and be confirming their zero and shooting a zero because let's be honest, it's most the most boring thing you can do. And when I first started shooting, my zero uh, pretty much consisted of shooting a small block of wood. Um, I, it wasn't very good or accurate. And it actually wasn't until more recently that I started taking my zero even more seriously, confirming with every gun, confirming at 200 meters, making sure the zero, when the round reconverges with my... Um, point of aim at 200 meters uh, is actually correct. It's actually accurate. So something that you can do as a, as a new gun owner is use a actual zero target for your rifle. Uh, learn about the, there's essentially three different zeros. You've got a 100 meter zero where your optic and the trajectory of the round are going to meet at 100 meters. You've got one where they meet at 50 meters. You've got one where they meet at 36 meters. And then you have some that people uh, uh, make up and claim are theirs, but the, the, the main three zeros out there for a 5.56 rifle with a 16 inch, 14.5, 10.5, 11 inch barrel, any of those sort of 5.56, you know, traditional barrel lengths is going to be a 50 slash 200, a 100, and then the Marine uh, 36 meter zero. So basically what we have here is uh, three different little rifle pictograms with a bolt trajectory uh, coming out of the barrel in a straight line, and then 5.56 will typically drop off real suddenly. And what happens is when you go to zero your optic, you are zeroing your optic um, generally at a, a close distance between, you know, 10 to 100 meters is typically what people are zeroing for directly. 
Uh, that is where the optic is going to meet with the trajectory of the round. At whatever distance that you decide, 40, 50, 100, 25, whatever it is. And so what you're going to get with this first one is the, the most common zero out there for uh, 5.56 five, guns, at least nowadays at 5200. The optic and the round are going to meet at 50 meters. Now, because the optic is sitting above the barrel and the optic actually has to aim down slightly to actually meet with the trajectory at 50, what that means is the optic is then going to basically be shooting in a straight line, because that's what the optic is basically doing, underneath the trajectory of that round. But when that trajectory starts to drop, when that round starts to drop due to gravity, velocity, science, and all that stuff that you know goes over most of our heads, uh, that is going to meet up at some point, at a certain distance, back with that straight laser beam, basically, uh, uh, you know, line, sight line of the optic. And a 50 uh, meter zero with a 5.56 rifle with a 14.5, 16-inch barrel will typically meet again at 200 meters. That's why it's called a 5200. Now, it's important to understand, though, that's usually with, like, uh, a military velocity NATO round with a 16-inch barrel. So if you go to zero your... 10 and a half inch poverty pony AR pistol uh, using a 5200 meter zero. You need to understand that your loss of feet per second, uh, your, your wolf ammo or some other ammo you're using may actually result in you, you can have your pinpoint zero at 50 meters, but that reconvergence is actually gonna be maybe 170 or 160. And that's why we like to do confirmations. We like to confirm at distance to make sure, hey, what are my holds actually like? You know, am I uh, actually close to a, a true 200 or is it actually like a 150? Is it a 50, 150? Because I have a short barrel and I'm losing velocity, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the other most common zero out there is the 100 meter. Now the 100 meter zero is really nice because my optic is going to meet at that 100 meter mark and then after that the trajectory of the 5.56 round is typically beginning to drop off. So I'm just going to have to hold high, hold above the target at 150, 200, 300, 400. The round is going to start dropping down to the feet at like 500 meters. I'm not going to have any hold unders. I'm just going to have to hold over the target. It's super simple, really straightforward. It does typically mean though that my height over bore offset is going to be a little bit more. Uh, I'm going to have to th consider that out to 100 meters, unlike with a 50, uh, 200 meter zero. Uh, but as you could see with the 5200, I just mentioned hold unders. Because my optic is, is uh, uh, I'm angling the optic down more aggressively to meet with the trajectory at a closer range, that means there's going to be this kind of weird dead space from 50 to 200 where my optic is actually going to be floating below um, my trajectory of my round. And that's when I actually have to start aiming below like a steel target at 100 meters to actually land hits. And some people don't like to do that. So they opt for a 100 meter zero where they can just aim basically center of the target out to 100. And then after that, they just hold high like in a video game. It's pretty simple, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, but these are kind of the three zeros that people are doing with 5.56 guns with common rifles out there. And at the end of the day, all of those end up doing more or less the same thing for your gun. It's going to give you a point of aim where the rounds are going to meet at a close, sort of a closer range distance. And then there's going to be another one after that at another distance, except for the 100 meter one. So do a little bit of reading on each of those, pick one, and then actually go to the range and use a real zero target, shoot from the prone or shoot from your bench or have a stable shooting position, shoot three round groups and actually have an accurate zero for your rifle. Because I see a lot of people out there, they may have, they may not have the distance to, to confirm at distance. They will do a 25 offset zero on a target and they're like, ah, it's good enough. It's kind of in that box somewhere. And then as soon as they go to shoot at 100 or 200 or um, you know some other further distance, their zero is completely off because what is shown on paper up close uh, hides a lot of uh, deficiencies of the zero that are going to magnify with distance. So take your zero very seriously. Make sure you have a solid zero. Make sure everything is actually tightened down. That's a big mistake I see uh, people doing as well. They take their EOTech, they don't tighten the latch or another optic out there, and then the whole thing's kind of shifting a little bit. They go to zero and the group just keeps moving all over the place. Ensure this stuff is nice and tight, whether it's a, a more budgety option, you know, optic out there, whether it's one of these higher end optics. And if you have iron sights, do the same thing. Make sure these suckers are nice and tight and make sure you can actually zero them and, and make sure you, you do zero them. There's a lot of good resources out there for zeroing guns. We've got a free target on our website that you can download and use whenever you need to. It uh, doesn't cost a lot of money. It prints on a standard piece of paper. So there's no excuse not to use an actual zero target uh, versus shooting uh, Coke cans on a log or a giant silhouette target at the indoor range.
Weapon lights are a real fun one. Because on the, the first part of it, you've got people who want to put a light on their gun because they kind of, one, they understand that it's a good thing to have or they see everyone else doing it and they're like, ah, it's probably a good idea. Then you have the other side of people that say, well, if you put a, a light on your rifle, you're going to give away your position and you're going to get shot. He might get shot. Yeah. And I think these people have forgotten that, yeah, if you have a gun and the idea is for, you know, home defense or, or you're carrying on your body or something um, so that you can shoot, uh, maybe someone else for whatever reason. Uh, yeah, there's a high likelihood that you might be getting shot at too. Uh, you probably don't want to pull that pistol out unless there's, you know, lethal force is already being presented some other way. So yeah, the reality of maybe getting shot is there at all times. It's not that bad. People get shot all the time. It's kind of funny that people forget that. But as far as the weapon light goes, drawing attention to yourself, where maybe you take rounds, um, yeah, that is a risk that can happen. But also, we probably don't want to be shooting at stuff that we can't see, can't identify. Uh, that's how you end up shooting the wrong person at the wrong time, committing murder, and that's not very cool. So, weapon lights on rifles, on pistols, great idea. Seeing, super cool. So when people just, you know, go through that and they realize, I actually need a light. I want to see what I'm shooting at. Then they go, well, what do I buy? Do I go buy, again, the cheapest thing I can find on Amazon, this amazing, incredible device that has a laser built into it. It comes with a pressure switch. It's got to be the greatest thing ever. They even said that special Spec Ops veterans use them or whatever weird marketing they have. You want it to be special forces? So they slapped it on their gun. And uh, what they quickly figure out is the pressure switch breaks pretty much right away. Uh, you can't really zero the laser. It's not very bright. You're not going to see it in the day. And then the weapon light is super dim. This thing's actually already broken. I can't even turn it on to demonstrate for you guys. And it was like $30 or something like that. So, hey, that's kind of cool. But the reality is the weapon light is very similar to the optic. You want to have a decent weapon light that's going to stay on the gun. It's not going to break and recoil. It's not going to get destroyed. It's got good battery life, and it puts out a decent amount of lumens and or candela. So cheap little lights out there on the market. Um, highly do not recommend. If you are on a budget, the light that I recommend is the Protac HLX uh, from Streamlight. Uh, there, I've got one on this Mark 18 right here. It's like 120 bucks. Comes with pressure pads. It comes with stuff to attach it to the rail uh, or the forend of your rifle. Uh, omits a lot of lumens, a lot of awesome candela, and you can set it up in a very intuitive way. And that's something else that I see people making a mistake of when they uh, go and get their first light. They put it on one side of the gun, it might be a push cap, and they haven't really thought about turning the sucker on or turning the sucker on very quickly. They're like, yeah, I've got the light on there for uh, if I want it someday, maybe. Uh, but the reality is the, the goal of having a weapon light on a rifle is being able to turn it on when you need it and turn it off when you don't. So having something intuitive, whether that's a pressure switch at 12 o'clock, that as soon as I hit with my thumb when I want it and release, it turns off, that's one great method. Another one is uh, having a weapon light that has a standard uh, traditional push cap. And again, probably having this on the side of where my support hand is going to go. So my thumb can ride on that little pressure cap. And when I want a weapon light, I turn it on. And when I don't, I let go and it comes off. Uh, something as simple as that. And a lot of folks I see, especially on their first gun, they don't think about that intuition. They don't really think about light placement. They just slap that sucker on there and they're like, eh, I'll probably never need it and I'm just not going to think about it. But I've got it on the gun, so I somehow have that capability. No, the capability isn't there unless you actually have a way to turn it on uh, when you need it. So that's one area that uh, lots of mistakes are made, but it's actually very straightforward and there's some really good options out there. And then the last thing you don't want to do is inadvertently put a uh, IED on the end of your rifle. Uh, don't want to do that. Now, ergonomics can come down to personal preference. You know, and not everyone's size the same. Not everyone has orangutan arms. Not everyone's, you know, uh, um, a small person, uh, but there are a couple like little rules of thumb out there, little tips that can really make your rifle a little more intuitive, a little bit more comfortable, and also allow you to maybe shoot a little bit faster, uh, removing some of the tension from your body. So the first one is setting up length of pull. This is something that a lot of folks initially don't really understand, or maybe they understand it from like a, like a bolt gun or a hunting rifle, and then as soon as they get a rifle with a collapsing stock like this thing, they're like, oh, I don't... Uh, do I go all the way out or do I leave it all the way in? And they don't—they haven't really thought about it too much. And when I first started shooting, uh, I used to think having the gun as compressed as possible, keeping the gun tied into the body, uh, would actually be a good thing. So what I typically did with my collapsing stock 
is I went out, uh, I wanna say two clicks, something like this. And what this does is it tenses up your entire hand. I, I thought this was a good thing. Tenses up your entire hand. I'm all tight like this with on the gun. Uh, but the reality is what this does is this actually uh, causes so much tension in your hand that pulling the trigger quickly, it's not really gonna happen. And I've got pretty long arms to begin with, so this is even more exasperated. So uh, not real great. Got a really aggressive bend in the elbow, especially on this short gun. That's not, that's not horrible. Uh, but what's going on right here it's not very, um, it's not very, it's not very intuitive, and it's not going to allow me to shoot very quickly. So something you can do if you have a rifle with a collapsing stock, such as a, an AR-15, is, and this is a great little trick, grab the pistol grip as you would when you're normally shooting, and retract the stock to the crook of your uh, arm where your elbow is. And this should give you, generally speaking, and it's a little different for everyone, you might go all the way out, you might be one click in, uh, that is going to give you a very comfortable location as far as where your wrist is placed on the gun when you actually go to start manipulating the trigger. Uh, you might wanna click, you know, one, one click in if you start wearing a plate carrier or body armor. Uh, you might decide you wanna run it all the way out just because you have a shorter gun and you wanna have your arm extended out a little further and that obviously won't be a problem. Um, I'm typically around all the way out or one click in, and that gives me that nice, you know, relieves a lot of tension from the hand and allows me to work that trigger really fast. So if you wanna shoot fast, sometimes it is about your body mechanics on occasion. And then the next one is uh, grip placement. Uh, this is a, a great one that um, it really, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, go, people go out and buy the Daniel Defense Rifles and typically speaking, the grip's all the way out like this, and they pull the stock out, and they go, yeah, I think this, I think we're good to go with this setup right here. This is not very good ergonomics for a lot of reasons. Um, one is we don't really want to uh, hyperextend our arm. We don't want to lock our elbow out uh, because as soon as we, you start shooting on the move, uh, you're creating one solid structure to your core and any sort of impact that's occurring as you step into potholes or you start moving a little bit quicker is going to translate to the rifle. That's why we like to have a little bend in the elbow to act as that natural suspension system. So as I'm shooting and moving or I need to transition, I actually have the ability to do so and I'm not locked out like this shooting my rifle and actually causing all kinds of issues. If you're standing still and you're never moving, this works really great, but as soon as you start moving and shooting, uh, that's when problems occur. So if you go out and buy a rifle like this, I highly recommend either removing the grip, maybe moving the grip further back to where you have that more natural position. You establish your length of pull with the stock. So in this case, I already know being a, an avid Air 15 shooter, I'll be like one click in or one click out. So that's pretty natural. I go to a location that gives me that nice bend in the elbow. And so I now know that that grip is going to be somewhere around here. I move it and now I have a nice intuitive setup that's gonna be really easy to use. I then place my weapon light somewhere around where my hand is. And I now have a rifle that is set up for my arms, my body, that's going to give me some very good body mechanics when it comes to shooting well. And as far as using a foregrip uh, in the first place, that's something a lot of people do. They see it in, or they've used it in Call of Duty. It helps with recoil management or something, or uh, it's just another cool accessory you can put on your rifle. They do have some benefits. There are some benefits to running uh, a vertical grip, uh, especially in terms of creating more, intu more intuition with your uh, lasers and lights, where now my wrist can actually rotate and activate those really easily. But the reality is they're not always very necessary. It's not something you should necessarily go and invest in unless you know it's going to aid you on that particular rifle. But there's also some really cheap ones out there that do a really good job. I highly recommend the BCMs. I've been using those for like seven years now. Uh, they're cheap. You're not spending a bunch of money for a bunch of gizmos. It doesn't fold. It do I, why would I want a folding grip anyway? I mean, I, maybe for bag use, but nobody's really doing that. Um, you're going to spend an extra, you know, a lot of extra money on that, and then it's extra parts that can fail. Uh, this little guy right here is like $25, $30, uh, and I'm done. It's not going to break. It's not going to come off. Um, it gives me exactly what I need. It's angled so I can flip it one way or another and I can chop it shorter if I need to and I'm set. Um, usually uh, the best items are the ones that are the most simple. Uh, but the reality is most folks, you can get into shooting without having that vert grip and then you can get one later if it's something that you really think is gonna help your shooting or give you a little bit more control. Uh, but most people are slapping stuff on there thinking it's gonna help their shooting and that's very rarely the case. So the next one, and this one's my favorite, is people going out 
on buying muzzle brakes, thinking it's gonna solve all their problems when it comes to recoil management. And they go and buy these weird muzzle devices on eBay and things that look like, something like what, what a ring race would use or something. And then you see them on the range because they put it on the gun. They're really happy about that. And you see them on the range and the gun's still jumping all over the place. How could this be? You've already put a $200 or $100, you know, or $30 muzzle brake on your gun with 50 ports on it all facing up or you kind of time it to the right and the gun's still jumping around. Well, the reality is it's bad technique. You can shoot an A2 birdcage like this guy right here. You will shoot this gun just fine compared to a muzzle brake rifle if you're using solid technique. And this is a short gun. This one's going to recoil a little bit more than some crazy 16 inch gun with a muzzle brake. But again, it all comes down to training and technique. No purchase of an accessory like a muzzle brake is going to solve all your problems because at the end of the day, it is impossible to make a rifle shoot 100% flat because the gun literally requires recoil to operate. It is a recoiling weapon that has to eject a casing to load a new one. There is going to be force that is occurring in the gun in order for the weapon to work in the first place. So there will always be some amount of recoil and your ability to control that recoil with technique is way more important than putting some device thing, crappy whatever on the end of it thinking that'll solve all your problems. Uh, stock placement's a big one. I want to have that stock position in such a way that it is actually, I have surface area from my arm and I'm rolling my arm into that, uh, that I'm going to be able to control uh, the weapon. I don't want to be doing this necessarily. It'll cause a lot of inconsistency in my sight returning, uh, rising and falling. I want to make sure that this is set up and this is good to go. Uh, there are some use cases for a muzzle brake. For example, on this gun right here, I have a Surefire Mini suppressor. And I do have a Surefire uh, muzzle brake on this one. And part of the reason for that is it actually acts as a sacrificial baffle. And it works really well uh, with this particular suppressor. Uh, but normally, I don't really like shooting with muzzle brakes. Um, they are really loud. They're really concussive. Shooting with other people, shooting in a confined space, they absolutely suck. Um, but for dedicated suppressed use, they can be really handy. And that's why a lot of companies out there, suppressor companies especially, um, have their host muzzle device be a muzzle brake to begin with. And then you just leave a suppressor on there at all times. And uh, that's how their muzzle device is intended to be used. So can you take a rifle like this, 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 this slight abomination, and still go out there and get good reps in and get good training in? And the answer is yes, you can. You can absolutely get out to the range, shoot at close range with this particular optic, get some good hits, learn some weapon manipulation, weapons handling skills, and get a feel for what this gun does. It's absolutely you can. Would this gun be suitable for certain things? You know, home defense maybe? I would definitely change out the light. This is a piece of crap. You can already see it's falling apart and it's already breaking. Um, swap out the light, would this work for that? Absolutely, it could absolutely work for that. But if you're purchasing a rifle for the purpose of the Second Amendment, the true purpose of the Second Amendment, you probably need to be purchasing and thinking about buying a rifle and having the capability of an infantryman. And what this means is having a rifle that is durable something that's reliable, something that allows you to engage to 200, 300 meters. Maybe that means you need to have uh, an optic for that. Maybe you need something like an ACOG um, or a magnifier to go with your red dots. So you can actually do, get positive identification at that distance and then be able to land accurate fire. A lot of folks out there, they're buying rifles, they say for the purpose of the Second Amendment, but to them that's Bambi, that's home defense. And if you're gonna make an argument of buying an item, owning an item, or that you should be able to own an item for the purpose of the Second Amendment, then you're really gonna to need to be, to be honest with yourself uh, of what that is actually going to require of you as a citizen and also um, in terms of the capability that you are purchasing. And I don't see a lot of people thinking about that. I don't see a lot of people talking about that, but that conversation needs to be had and people need to be real honest with themselves because to be quite honest, this is not a, a, a very good rifle for that. This thing is kind of crappy. There's a lot, much better options out there, much better accessories, uh, much better uh, items that are more reliable, more rugged, that will give, be much more effective. And that's something that you need to be thinking about. Like, what is that? Oh, that's a QD thing on the bottom of the gas block. Interesting. 
So with all that said, guys, I hope that's helpful. We have training resources on our website uh, to help you guys. If you do want to take a rifle like this one, maybe you've just purchased something a little bit better. Maybe you just went and got a Colt 6920 and you're just going to put a, you know, an aim point on there and call it a day and start going to work. We've got some training stuff on our website under the training page. We've got drills, we've got explanations, we've got free tips on there. And then we have all kinds of help articles on our site detailing what to buy, when to buy it, how to buy it, and what to buy. If that is something that you are just really confused on, you don't want to rely on Amazon ads, and you don't really want to rely on the guy behind the counter at your, pawns, your, your, your pawn shop who's going to try to sell you whatever weird gun has come in that week. So thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.